My mind is really strange. It gets me in trouble all the time. <laughs> Um, and I, I remember when I wrote The Ecology of Commerce, and the first two times I talked about it, you know, people walked out of the room. They left in, in, in disgust and anger. Um, one of them was Chevron, which I didn't feel so bad about, but uh, another one was Burger King. But nevertheless, you know, so what I want to talk about is what I'm thinking about rather than some presentation to you, you know, that's like a download. And I think a lot about climate and energy because I think it's the defining um, <clears throat> uh, issue of this century and the next century to come for that matter. And when I, generally when I go into a subject or into an area as a writer, as a researcher, in this case also as a business person, um, I try to suspend you know, the conventional wisdom because as we all know, it's just usually conventional. And, um, and look at it with new eyes. It's a look, look at the problem, look at it in a way that perhaps, um, not that I'm original, but look at it in a way that helps me see it in its entirety, in, in the way it's really connected to everything else. And it was really uh, very much helped out um, by an invitation I received from the Prince of Denmark, literally. Um, I'm an English major, so if you get an invitation from the Prince of Denmark, it's a big deal. <laughs> it's like, uh, and uh, the Prince of Norway and the Princess of uh, Sweden, and the three of them are having a royal fact-finding trip to Greenland on climate change. And it was to the Neem Ice Station, which is the North Greenland Emian uh, Research Station, which is uh, 500 kilometers from any known human artifact. So you, when you get there, you're there, and you, you land in a whiteout and leave in a whiteout, and you land in these LC-130s from the Schenectady National Guard, which seconds their people to the uh, climate research uh, alternatingly between the Arctic and the Antarctic, depending on the season. A uh, great group of people. And you, you land in this really nowhere, uh, uh, two miles of ice um, uh, beneath you, and uh, with a geodesic dome where the kitchen is, and tents where you sleep, and then an ice cave. And the ice cave is where all the action is. And you go down this ice cave, and it really looks like something out of a B movie, you know, uh, where you know they're digging, and something comes out from the past, you know, uh, and uh, some great Hollywood monster. But it really is. You, you go down there, and it, it, it is like a whole world. It's science uh, underneath the ice, and uh, uh, men and women from 14 nations, and. Just to give you a sense of the, um, the danger of being there, the, uh, just a few weeks before, one of the person, persons who had been there for 10 years, expert, knowledgeable, this guy knew Arctic conditions, ice, snow, was a person who trained people about survival and uh, went out slightly underdressed, which is easy to do because no matter how much you bundle up there, you're underdressed. Um, underdressed, and then there was a whiteout, and he did what he you should never do, which is he kept walking instead of staying where he was. And he was found a day and a half later, um, and now he's a quadruple amputee. So the, the the men and women, the scientists who are there, are not just you know fooling around. I mean, they're doing this extraordinary work, and what they were doing is drilling down, which they hit after we left to the last interglacial period, which is the Eemian period, 125,000 years ago, when it was 450 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, so it's a good way to benchmark. And of course, at that time, there was hippopotami in the Thames River and you know, lions and panthers in Germany. It was very different alligators in Alaska. It was a different time. And, um, and what they can do by, they, it's beautiful, they take out these ice cores so delicately, and, and they come up obviously deep, and they use coconut oil to lubricate the, um, the, the drilling. So when it comes up, there's this uh, gurgling blah, 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 sound, and this coconut milk is kind of spilling out, and it's very surreal. And, um, and they take these ice cores and they lay them very, very gently, you know, 10, 14 feet long, down. And, uh, and then catalog them and put them away, and everything's frozen there so they don't have to freeze it. But, but you can take an, like a, 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 an anode cathode and you can run it along 
the core, and you can read out the isotopes, you know, in the material that was in the rainwater at that moment, and you can have instant readouts in terms of what the temperature was and what was happening in the atmosphere. And as we took out one core, and they ran it along, and there was a spike, you know, and they said, okay, that's SO2, and that was a, a huge volcanic event in the 14th century. It wasn't Krakatoa in Indonesia, it was another one. And they said that's been confirmed by the Antarctic too. They had, so it was, it was, it was trans-equatorial, it wasn't just hemispheric. And uh, so it's extraordinary knowledge you know, that, you, that we're getting, you know. And then we have these conferences and, and wonder why nobody cares <laughs> about um, our knowledge, which is so exquisitely derived and, 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 and done. And when I came back from there, um, uh, I, I started to do uh, a lot more research on, on this question of energy. And one of the, I, I believe that in, 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 in sort of cybernetic terms, if you optimize components in a system, you pessimize the system. In other words, if you, if you work on things with, it, singularly, if you try to solve problems, you know, and isolate them and solve the problem, you oftentimes create problems you didn't un predict and you didn't anticipate. And so it seems to me that if we're going to address this, we have to look at it from a systemic point of view. And w one of the sort of helpful ways of doing that is to divide energy up, because we think of energy as that as drives our cars and electricity and industry, which is true. Um, but another way to look at energy is a different typology, which is long energy and slow energy and fast energy. And, and these three types of energy are all driven by the sun. And all of them are diminishing and declining and they go like this. And long energy is what we often think about, which is carbon-based energy, which is gas and, and coal and oil. And it took a very, very long time of stored sunlight to create these bodies of energy, which we're you know, having this like once in a billion year blowout sail of right now. And, and, and so long energy is very much you know, on our minds. And we think of the energy problem, we think of long energy. Uh, but there's also slow energy. And slow energy is, is, is glaciers, uh, it's topsoil, it's forests, uh, it's all the <clears throat> living systems um, that basically contain sunlight and the energy and create humus and create watersheds and create catchments and create rivers which are fed by glaciers uh, which feed agriculture. Um, and this is slow energy, and, 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 and then there is fast energy, which you're eating, um, which is food and photosynthesis and rainfall and the hydrological cycle, so forth. Um, and these three types of energy are extraordinarily related, of course, because as we burn more long energy, we are changing uh, the, the impact on, on slow and fast energy is, 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 is pronounced because we change weather patterns and climate and we get more rain, more water in the, in, in the sky at one time, heavier clouds, we get longer droughts, we dry out and parts out soils, we melt glaciers, uh, we um, uh, see these huge uh, fires, you know, both in the, in the tundra and, and in Montana and in, the, in Russia and so forth that can't be put out because the, the forests have dried up. And um, so when we think of uh, slow energy being diminishing, when we think of the Himalayas and the source of five major rivers, then we think of agriculture for two billion people, right, being diminished by long energy. And the thing is that all of these are, are, are failing at the same time. And the thing is what we're doing, though, as you know, is we're taking one of them and then subsidizing the other one with it and thinking that's the solution. So then we'll go grow corn or palm oil or something, you know, which is basically fast energy, and then we'll say, okay, we're gonna solve the long energy problem by taking more fast energy, right? Which takes more slow energy because it takes more water. And uh, so we're kind of chasing our tail in many ways when we solve these problems by turning to another, if you will, energy sector and then trying to, to fix things that way. We don't fix anything. We just rearrange the nature of the problem and make it worse with all due respect. 
Now, the, if we look at the world's energy, we use about 16 terawatts, uh, that's a trillion watts, 16 terawatts a day, and um, it's a lot of energy. Uh, the ads and the things you see where somebody, you know, has a helicopter fly over a solar farm and says in one hour, you know, the Earth receives as much energy as we use in a year is, is factually true. Um, however, um, the uh, quality of the energy we need is very different than sunlight. And the energy we use uh, to replace it, to really go to, um, uh, to accomplish what Hansen and, and so many other people want us to do in terms of uh, capping uh, carbon content at 450 parts per million, uh, in the next 25 or 30 years uh, would require um, in an, it, 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 uh, uh, an, uh, an industrial revolution or industrial activity that would um, be more than anything we've ever done as human beings in terms of the activity and the investment and the people and the jobs. And it would take 100 square meters of solar, 15% solar panels every second. Uh, for 25 years every second. It would take 50 square meters of solar thermal mirror every second for 25 years. It would take a three megawatt wind turbine every hour for 25 years. It would take a, a, a hundred uh, megawatt uh, a geothermal plant every three hours uh, for 25 years. It would take one uh, three gigawatt nuclear power plant every week for 25 years, or take Olympic-sized swimming pool of algae for biodiesel every second for 25 years, and we'd still be using 20% of energy from carbon-based uh, sources. And that would assume that we didn't use any more energy in 20, 30 years than we do right now. In other words, that assumes that we cap our consumption at 16 terawatts, and the next two billion people will come in, share that, and the rest of us don't increase our impact or by the products we buy or by economic development in the emerging world, which is a juggernaut of energy uh, growth, um, which means that it would require an enormous effort in terms of the efficiency side or the effectiveness and the productivity with which we use energy. And even then, right now, it means that we'd be a, a 2300 watt society, which is that your energy allowance every day would be 2300 uh, watt bulbs uh, on for 25 hours a day. And that includes your car, your transatlantic you know, airplane trips, you know, your, um, uh, your, your clothing, your food, uh, the carpool with the kids to the school. Everything you know, is in that 2300 watts. And, um, and you here in New York are, are uh, easily uh, 10 to 15,000 watt people, I can assure you, <laughs> maybe higher. And um, the average American is 10,000 watts. I don't know, you know, you might be less. New York, you walk a lot, but no, uh, still, it, it means a, a, an extraordinary change. And if you then do your own math, if, if we actually double our energy consumption in 30 years, which is widely heralded, then you can take all those numbers I just gave you about what we have to do and double them, right? Uh, but w I, I recently gave a talk in Saudi Arabia to, uh, at the invitation of the government, and it was on innovation, and I called this speech the Red Queen Dilemma, which caused some consternation because everybody was talking about you know, <laughs> creativity, imagination, and innovation, and here I am, my speech is called The Dilemma. And, um, but I actually find, um, I find problems more in interesting than wishy-washy projections of solutions. <laughs> because problems to me stimulate thinking and stimulate creativity. You, you, you know, freedom uh, and a big checkbook does not stimulate creativity. It's resistance, blockage, you know. Uh, I, I know. I know Philip as an artist, and I'm, I'm sure that you feel the same thing. It's when you get to that point where it doesn't work is when you, you get the breakthroughs, not when you, know, you just have complete freedom. And, and I think it's true in terms of the, 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 the ability for us to really finally and, and accurately define the nature of the problem is really the source of solutions as opposed to sort of hall passes that we're giving right now to things that are clearly not in our interest, like bioethanol, you know, which is you know, so destructive. Um, and so 
the red queen dilemma has to do with these the dynamics between these, the long, slow, and fast energy, which again I don't think we're looking at. And what I mean by that is that um, we we're going into an era in which the, the the demand for energy is is going to go up. The demand certainly for fossil fuel energy and for oil is going up because whether peak oil is now or 10 or 20 years, it doesn't matter. It seems we're at peak production um, because there is no increase in the last seven years in terms of liquid, liquid fuels. And um, the, uh, it's interesting, uh, when I was in Saudi Arabia, and they are doing 8.5 uh, million barrels a day, the second largest producer in the world after Russia, uh, three and a half million barrels they're consuming, one and a half million barrels for uh, making electricity. Only the Saudis and the Venezuelans make electricity from oil, uh, but they do. Uh, and two million for their own uh, traffic jams and cars. And so they said that within 25 years, unless they convert to renewable energy and nuclear power, they won't have any oil to export whatsoever. None. It'll all be consumed by Saudi Arabia. And um, so you're seeing this tremendous demand in the emergent economies and the oil producers for their own energy as opposed to, oh, we'll sell it to the Americans. Uh, they want it for themselves and they're developing. So it creates a very interesting dynamic. And the red queen dilemma is the opposite of industrialization. Industrialization was when we used energy more and more productively and we, used, and we produced more and more with less and less. And that is how you raise income. That there's no real true rise in income unless you have productivity. And when productivity ceases, then you have a stalling of income, and when it goes down, then you have actually real income going down. I mean, that's just economics 101. Well, what's happening in the world, and what you're seeing now is that, and in, in uh, uh, one of the great Wall Street um, private equity um, uh, people recently said, uh, to a conference of business people uh, echoing Danell and Dennis Meadows and said, we are running out of everything. And he's right. We really are. And what that means is that for an Indian farmer or uh, an Oklahoman to get water means you have to go deeper down uh, into the boreholes, you know, into the aquifers, to the fossil water. And there's a geometric increase in energy as you go down with a linear increase in depth in terms of how much kerosene or electricity or whatever it is that you use to get that water up. We have more and more people. We are now opening up marginal soils, marginal lands to farming. In some cases, lands that should never be opened up, like in the Amazon. But we're opening up marginal soils. It takes more diesel, more tractors, uh, more herbicides, more pesticides in order to get the same amount of yield that you would get on, say, Nebraska land or Saskatchewan or, or in China and so forth. These soils are marginal. They take more energy. Uh, energy itself, when we first started in 1859, we first discovered oil, I mean, the, we don't know exactly, but at least between 100 and 151, for every unit of energy that we put into the, to the, the ground, we got 100 to 150 units out of energy a huge yield of energy. Well, in this century, it was about 100 to 1 at the beginning, the last century, excuse me, it went to 70, 30, 20, and now it's about 12 to 1. But really, we're going to a 7 to 1 regime in a few years, so it's 1 to 7. But if you look at the sources where we're, where we're talking about, the new sources, Athabasca tar sands, I'm sorry, 1 and a half to 1. 2 to 1, maybe on a good day, not counting the damage and remediation of the damage it does to the environment. So R Russia right now you know, is around 7 to 1. The Saudis won't even tell us, but we think they're about 12 to 1. They started at 150 to 1. So the oil is there, but the, the, the amount of energy it takes to get it out is extraordinary. And the largest discovery of oil in the last 30 years was the Kashagan field in Kazakhstan. And that had 14, has 14 billion barrels of oil. It's taken 20 years to get to it because it's so poisonous, that particular type of oil. Very tricky. Until the Tupi fields in the Santos Basin were discovered in Brazil in the last few years. 
So the Tupi fields in the Santos Basin are 16,000 um, feet under the water, 160 miles out to sea, a mile through a salt dome, a salt dome, which requires drill bits that can withstand 2,000 degrees centigrade. And it's going to take 20 to 30 years to get that oil. The t uppermost projection of the yield is 40 billion barrels of oil, which will last us for 15 months. So those are the two biggest strikes in the last 30 years. And what I'm saying here is the price of oil is going to go up. <laughs> no question about it. It's just we're just not finding it. It's not there. It doesn't matter what the Exxon ads say. The fact is, if they were finding it, we would hear about it. It's simply not there. Is there oil in the Arctic? Of course. But interestingly, in the last eight years, you know, we've used 25% of all the oil there was ever discovered, last, me, last 10 years, of, there was ever, excuse me, ever consumed. So all the oil we burned to date, we used 25% of it in the last 10 years. And that happens to be 25% of all the known, estimated, and proven reserves of oil that are out there. So, okay, so that's oil. But what you're seeing, again, is that at the Copiapa mine, the San Jose mine, Copiapa, Chile, remember the miners down there 49 days and then how emotional that was? How wonderful, it was an American company from Pennsylvania that saved them. Great press. Why were they down there? <laughs> They're down there because that's how deep you have to go to get copper now. And so as we move to lower and lower grade ores, it takes more energy to get that or to crush it to 40 micron, to refine it, and to then smelt it into copper, right? Same with our iron. Same with all our minerals, right? And so it's taking more energy. So as you use more energy to do the same thing, you put more demand on the price of energy goes up. The price of water goes up. The price of food is going to go up, right? So the Red Queen dilemma is from Alice in Wonderland, you know, when she tells Alice to win the race, she said, you know, you know, the faster you go, you know, the, you know, the sooner you stay where you are. And if you want to go somewhere, you have to go fat, twice as fast as that. In other words, the, the, the faster we go to be productive puts more and more pressure on the very resources and we get less and less and less. In other words, we flip the organizing principle of the industrial age. And that's the dynamic I'm looking at. I'm going, is anybody looking at this? Am I just out of it, you know? It, but I don't see how this is going to change in the near future. And then on top of that, if I can get really odd on you, is you may have read or may, I mean, you don't notice it, but you may notice it in Miami and different airports because they're repainting those little signs at the end of the runway because true north is not true north anymore, nor is true south, you know. And the reason it's not is because the magnetic uh, pole is moving really quickly. And it used to move five kilometers a year from, toward, from Canada towards Siberia. And the last 10 years, it's moved 50 kilometers a year. It's moving faster and faster and faster. It's like, I'm going, well, what's happening? Well, we know that the the poles have shifted, you know, sometimes every 50,000 years. The last time was 780,000 years ago. We're not talking about pole shift, we're talking about a magnetic pole shift, though. That is a shift of what is magnetic north. Well, why should we care? Well, we should care a lot because the magnetosphere, which is that surrounds the Earth, which protects the Earth, interacts with the magnetic sphere of the Sun. And so the direction of the magnetic sphere, in terms of its orientation to the Sun, affects processional wobble, it, it affects ocean currents, it affects weather, jet streams. Um, you have now not to loosen clouds coming in, these poisonous clouds piercing into the atmosphere. There are ornithologists now who are saying that may be the cause of sudden bird death, you know, which is these birds dropping out of the sky. I mean, it's a very plausible explanation. Uh, we don't have so many plausible explanations, but whether it's true or not, the fact is the not to loosen clouds are there and they're piercing into the atmosphere. 
What we're also seeing is when you get that kind of shift historically, and this goes back to the Eemian period and other research that geologists have done, when you see that kind of magnetic shift, you get a, a heightening of volcanic activity. And we saw, we saw this year that you had this La Nina phenomenon, but what happened, you had the Kamchatka, uh, Kamchatka volcanoes really cooling the air, pushing La Nina down, the Pineapple Express, and creating these monster storm, this 2,000 mile blizzard across the United States. So when you get this kind of shift, this rapid shift in the magnetosphere, you get a weakening of it, it weakens as it shifts so quickly, becomes uh, less powerful, and at the same time, you, you, you unleash uh, what could be called the preconditions of superstorms. And if Pakistan wasn't a superstorm, I don't know what it wasn't. You can still see satellite photographs that it's still flooded in Pakistan. It didn't just recede. And the Yasi, the storm in Queensland, extraordinary storm. It's just by luck that it didn't you know, kill a lot of people and destroy things. But it was a, ma a major force five hurricane, of course, you know, cyclone there. But, but just extraordinary storm, like the likes of which we've never seen, right? So you add that, and then you look at, um, you know, I was in London last year when the uh, Yapala Yoku uh, volcano um, uh, uh, erupted in Iceland, and we were the, uh, as they called the London taxi drivers, called us the left behinds. You know, we <laughs> we couldn't go anywhere, <laughs> and um, because of volcanic ash, um, and that was serious from, from air point of view, air traffic and, and airplane safety. But right now in Iceland, you're seeing, you know, Bartabunga, which is Bartabunga is this extraordinary volcano. In the last time a major eruption was 14, I think 13 or something like that, it was the largest lava eruption in 10,000 years, okay, that volcano. And, um, and there was an instant mini ice age for years after that. And I think, and so that now is having a tremendous amount of seismic ac activity. So what I'm saying is we connect these dots so we could be in this regime where on one hand we need to reduce the carbon content of the atmosphere to level it off and then reduce it, no question about it. At the same time, going into a very volatile period in terms of climate, which is not unusual on Earth. It's just unusual for modern civilization. But it's not unusual at all. This is not extraordinary. It's going to be extraordinary for us if it happens. And the combination of those two really play deeply upon the lack of resilience or the resilience of a society, a culture, a place, a town, a country, a region, uh, a family, a community. And we have such a brittle society now. And the, the, so the, there's two things happening now with climate. One is to ameliorate, to stop, to prevent as much as possible, though it's pretty set in stone right now that there will be. But the other is to create adaptive systems. That is to say, so that this is, I mean, this is a civilizational issue. This is not a historical issue. This is not a climatological issue. It's not a food issue. It's not an energy issue. It's a civilizational issue. And, and how, that has been misinterpreted and reduced, you know, to uh, special interests. <laughs> I, I don't know. We'll leave that to forensic historians to figure out, you know, like how did we as a culture reduce such an extraordinary moment in human civilization uh, to bad catchphrases and, and hearings to expose you know, the malfeasance of climate scientists and the House of Representatives, you know. I mean, this is what's going on when, in fact, the dynamics that we have to deal with encompass every single aspect of our life. It's not just like the energy guys over there and this, you know, and science here and we'll go lead our lives if you just put more solar panels up, you know. It's not going to happen. And, um, and lastly, I want to say, too, I, I also want to say I think uh, with all due respect, that the, the delusions on the right about climate change are pretty well matched by the delusions on the left about the solutions. <laughs> and, um, and to me, you know, if hope is to pass a sobriety test, it has to p walk a pretty straight line to reality. And one of those lines is through the second law of thermodynamics. You know, thank you very much. 
because it's physics. It's not about people say, I don't believe in climate change. I don't care what you believe. Physics is physics. It doesn't care at all what you think. And our energy solutions are about physics. They're not about sentiment or feeling or... And one of the, the things that I see that, that uh, is, is particularly, and I'm in solar, and, but, uh, and is, is solar, and I, I see solar being the, you know, the, the, the technology that gets this biggest hall pass, you know, and saying, oh my gosh, you know, that's the answer. And yes, I mean, I mean in, in, in a conceptual way, the sunshine photons are our answer. But solar technology, as Mark Spittler, who's head of fourth generation research at DOE said, is extraterrestrial. It was designed, solar PV was designed for satellites, period. And uh, it works really well in space. And when you bring it down to Earth, you have a problem. And the problem is, it's the most toxic form of energy there is per kilowatt hour, period. More than nuclear, more than coal. And uh, we just overlook it. And furthermore, the energy return on energy invested for solar is about five to one, not very outstanding. Uh, hunting gathering societies have an average of 10 to one return, by the way. So solar is, you know, half of hunting gathering. And the most salient point, though, is it, it's not renewable. Solar is not renewable. It takes fossil fuels to make a solar panel. You need intense concentrated energy, coal, nuclear, gas, to make the aluminum, the float glass, to center the semiconductors, to mine the rare earths, you know, to put a solar panel together, and it produces what? 12 volt DC diffuse energy. You can't take that 12 volt DC energy and transform it up, step it up, and make high intensity energy without a huge net loss of energy. So it's a complete net loss. So solar can't make solar, it's not renewable. Right? So this is one of the things that, I know I've talked to Bill McKibben about this, you know, put the panels back on the White House, well, go ahead, but, but they're toxic. And, and they're not really a good solution, as they are now presently made. And as Mark Spittler said, we need terrestrial solar. We do, we need solar. It's the right idea, I'm not saying that. But we don't need, you know, this sort of engineering wet dream, you know, in a rectangle on our roofs, you know, because, if you've ever been to a solar factory, it looks like a moonshot. I mean, it's just robots and this and sputtering and, and men and women in spacesuits because the silane gases will kill them if they breathe them. And you go in there and say, oh my God, this is the future? I hope not. Because it's the same mindset that got us into this trouble in the first place, which is force, violence. And what we have to understand is that our technology is violent. Our agriculture is violent. The way we educate our children is violent. The way we treat women is violent. It's violence everywhere. It's not just in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's, it's, it pervades everything we do, and particularly technology. And this idea that you can force molecules to do what you want, you know, and, and we'll figure out what to do with the cadmium later. <laughs> yeah. The number one selling solar panel for solar is covered with cadmium. It's sputtered with cadmium. It's glass, a piece of cadmium sputtered glass. Maybe it's sold 15% of all panels in, in the world. What are people going to do with this glass in 20 years? I'm gonna, you know, take it to the dump, put it in the windows in Africa. I mean, it's crazy. So I wanted to say that it's not like we on the left or the progressive side have the answers, and if they would just listen to us, you know, then we would be on our way. I just, I really don't think that's true. And I think that there has to be some humility from us in terms of maybe we don't have the solutions yet. And maybe if we can create a conversation, which we're trying to do at Garrison, a conversation that's a little bit bigger, with a little bit more humility, so that it's a much bigger tent and include everybody in that conversation, then we have a chance of actually not just solving problems, but healing the divisions that prevent us from solving the problems, you know. And those divisions always come to me from ideologies, from righteousness, from the sense of, I know you don't, you know. And what we do know is physics, we do know science and so forth, you know. But beyond that, you know, we have to be really, really careful about being right, you know. And I, I, uh, 
I'll stop here, but I worked with uh, um, uh, Lee Scott, actually, at Walmart, in, in, uh, uh, who was the CEO for many years, and now Mike Duke is, but, and you know, they, they had studied for two years the environment, uh, and led by a guy named Jib Ellison, who is a river raptor, a great guy, and he took the, the executives from Walmart around for two years out into nature to climate research stations, down rivers, in campsites, uh, two ghettos and favelas and, and said, in, in, the, in, he, he, they were called, you are what you eat trips. In other words, so they could experience the environment, experience the, the uh, acidification and the deadening of the oceans and, and dead zones and so forth. Not tell them about it, not do PowerPoint presentations, not have lectures, but take them out and stay overnight. And, and, and get grizzled and talk about it at the campfire. And, you know, and so after two years, they actually kind of got it. They really did. And then and, and Lee, um, I had met, and um, that's another story, but, but, if, but I said to him, I said, why don't you come out and talk about this? He said, oh, I, you know, I, I talked about it in the LA Press Club, and, 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 and you know, I, it didn't do anything. I said, you didn't talk about it. You defended capitalism and globalization. You didn't talk about the environment. I said, nobody cares about those things. And, um, and I said, why don't you come out about the environment? He said, well, I don't know what to say. I said, that's what you should say. That's it. I understand. I get it. I don't know what to do. But watch this space, because we're going to do something. We don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to do something, because we get it. That's all you have to say. He said, and then, um, so I wrote him a letter and said what he really should say in detail. And he carried around, Jib said for months, he carried around and read it and airplanes put away. He says, is this Hawkins serious about this? And he is. So anyway, they, he finally decided to give a speech and he hired a speechwriter from um, uh, a PR agency here in New York and they went through 20 versions of it. And then he hired another one and they went through 10. Then he sent to corporate communications in Bentonville and they did a few versions. And then he called me three weeks before and said, uh, a friend of his, uh, who, not a friend of mine, but a, a, a vice president said, would you write Lee's speech? Uh, I said, why? And he said, well, it just, all the speeches are, are, are no good. Uh, and, um, you know, Burst and Marsteller and, you know, whatever. And, and so I said, well, let me, send me your content. Send me what you want to say. And, uh, you know, so I sent it to him in an email and I, 20 minutes, I emailed back and said, no thanks, I can't do it. I said, why? I said, there's nothing, you're not saying anything. <laughs> this is hard to write a speech. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and then Lee Scott called me, and this is really faithful, and he called me and said, Paul, he said, write the speech I should give. Forget the rest of it. I said, oh, this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I wrote the speech where <clears throat> he uh, committing to 100% renewable energy, 100% sustainable supply chain, zero waste, the rise in minimum wage. And, you know, I just put it all in. I mean, why not? <laughs> <clears throat> and he circulated the speech around. Um, oh, and, then, and the, the line I, uh, that he liked the be best but, uh, was that the Katrina was the environment in, in uh, slow motion, you know, basically. What's happening, you know, well, the environment, no, the end of the environment is Katrina in slow motion. And, um, and uh, he sent them around to everybody, the officers and everybody, and to a person, all 1,400 people said, don't give that speech. Do not give that speech. And he sent it back to him and said, read it again, because I'm going to give this speech. And he did. He really did. And um, it made a huge difference in the company, and the speech has been translated and published, and it's a case study and so forth. But th what's interesting is that a couple years, a few years later, I, was, I met him, talked to him, and he said, you know, what I didn't understand about the speech was that those aspirational goals were changed everything. And they gave everyone in the company a way of making decisions. Like, does this move us towards 100% renewable or move us away? Away? Then we're not going to do it. it was, so everyone was empowered by goals or aspirational, he said, and it released so much creativity in the company, so much energy, as opposed to, well, we're going to, you know, reduce carbon by 20% by 2020, which is like, meh, you know. And I mean, it's such a deadening goal. It's, you know, worthy, but, but it just, it's kind of dead on arrival. And, um, and I just, I feel like the same thing uh, about, um, uh, 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 us and is, is our goals are actually too small. <laughs> 
we need bigger goals. We need much bigger goals than 450 or 350. Or, I'm sorry, I mean, I love Bill McKibben, but we need bigger goals. And we, we aspirational goals release imagination and creativity. And short-term or, or, or possible goals don't. <laughs> What's possible doesn't really get us going, doesn't get us moving. And uh, uh, it's so interesting because when Jonathan, you know, <clears throat> uh, introduced me, he he didn't he he was calling the six paramitas in Buddhism <laughs> about my six qualities. It's so sweet, but um, and it was a kind of a a, a, a joke back to me. Um, uh, and, and what I had said recently once in a speech, and I'll probably say it now too, which is that. The, you know, the, the, the aspirational goal that I love the most is my business partner, Janine Benyus, who's a biologist, and she has this wonderful phrase, which is, life creates the conditions that are conducive to life. That's what life does. And you think about it, what else is there to do? Isn't that really what we're here to do? No matter what we do or what our profession is, or to create the conditions that are conducive to life. And, and that's what an economy should do, it's what a business should do, it's what a government should do. It's what a politician should do. It's what any technology should do. It's what development should do. Everything we do should be measured by that aspiration. Does it create the conditions that are conducive to life? Because life creates more life. That's why we're here. We're the beneficiaries, right? From that single cell in that oceanic vent, you know, 4.1 billion years ago, here we are. And the DNA from that cell is in your body, so you have a lot to be grateful for, right? So isn't that our role, isn't that, you know, and, and the, when I think of that phrase, you know, and, uh, and the speech that Jonathan is kind of echoing back to me, I said, if you look at the great religions, they, they really are biology in disguise, or biology is religion in disguise, you know. When the, the 99 attributes of Allah, Merkit, <clears throat> the sustainer, the restorer, Right, and the paramitas are perfection, generosity, patience, and Sermon on the Mount. You know, you're the salt of the earth, the light of the world. I mean, you know, you, you these these phrases and these sort of mnemonic kind of phrases that that really infuse our religious and spiritual beliefs. You know, are about the golden rule and <clears throat> creating the conditions that are conducive to life. You know. And <clears throat> I feel like I, I mention these, the dilemma we're in only because I get so excited about knowing the dilemma, not because I, I, I don't feel gloomy about it at all. <clears throat> Excuse me. I feel actually very excited, very activated about it. And I hope I haven't made you gloomy um, in any way. I just feel like the better we understand where we are and the dynamics that really are at play, the more energy is released from human imagination, from human creativity. And, and it breaks down the barriers and the constraints that seem to limit so often and so much of what we need to do in the, in the, in the, in the time in which we need to do that and so forth. And as a friend said, you, 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 know, you, 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 don't, you don't change by solving problems. You, know, you solve problems by changing. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and, and when we change our ground, our view, our a, a way of seeing, then solutions arise, you know. But solutions themselves, the problems, do not change our view and our ground of being. You know? So anyway, thank you so much for being a wonderful audience. <laughs>